Well, greetings, welcome in. We are so grateful that you chose this opportunity to see our First Grace morning worship celebrations together. We hope that this can be a resource for you in conjunction with belonging to and being known by a local church fellowship. By no means does this substitute that, and we pray that you, wherever you are, would be able to find that. We are so excited about the opportunity to study the scriptures together and we hope that this can be a resource for you. If you have been blessed by the ministries of First Grace as well, you can give back at www.firstgrace.com slash online giving, and we would love to be able uh, to see that investment go forward in ministry. So God bless you, and we hope that you are edified and delight in the scriptures as we study them together today. Thank you. Pastor Bruce, with the same heart that your father has presented me in 93 when I came here to study at Grace Theological Seminary, went back and still is in the ministry. I heard that you you are going through the book of James. Pastor James from Jerusalem. He want us to go back to the first churches and see how Christians in the early years suffer but they stick on their faith. I'm standing before you this morning to bring you back to one part of the world that your brothers and sisters are also suffering, being persecuted, but they still firm, the firm foundation because of their faith, because of our faith. I'm so grateful for the many years of blessing that I have from you. All the ministries that we are doing in Africa cannot succeed without your prayers and all your support. So I stand before you, my wife and I, to represent the 4,000 churches and more than 400,000 people who come every Sunday to worship God in our country. So let's remind ourselves that the man, you and I, can be blessed when we start by having faith in the cross. But every time I ask myself, Am I prepared to suffer like Jesus suffered for my sin? Have I prepared my family to suffer? Have I prepared the church of my country when persecution comes? So let us give you the picture of the Christianity in Africa. We are about 50 to 89% of Christians all over the country of Central African Republic. And religion, traditional religion represents 35%. Muslims, they represent 50%. So can you move up, please? Muslims represent 50% of the population. But Muslims, they control the economy of a country. So some Christians, some girls, accept to be married with, Christ, uh, with Muslims, people, so they can survive. 
because life is very difficult and it is difficult for some people to survive. I have put the, uh, the, the map of Central African Republic so you can, you can see the map of where the Grace Brethren churches are scattered across the country. So the next slide will show you the map of the churches represented by the yellow color. And those are all the places that you see are full of Grace Brethren churches across the country. The green part are non-evangelized part of a country that need missionaries to be sent there. The next map give you the legacy that we earn after 100 years. More than 400 churches you find in Cameroon, in Sierra, Chad, Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Nigeria, we have a point of light that grace churches are planting in those parts of a continent. More than 200 pastors. So you see the number of churches and the number of pastors. That means we need to train more pastors so each church can have at least one pastor and many other Bible schools and medical work. But we are struggling. We are facing threats. And there are a lot of threats in the country. Three decades of rebellion and unrest. There are continued people who are displaced in the country and refugees in other African countries. And some young people integrate, you know, the rebels group because they give them guns and they say, if you use guns, you can become rich. So they turn and they kill their own families. You see that there is a, uh, a map of different places where the, you see the rebels. We have 14 rebels group across the country. The blue colors are the anti-Balaka. The anti-Balaka are people who are not Muslims. They use machetes to fight. The, uh, the, the rest of the group are uh, Muslims who came from Chad, from Sudan, and they, they meet with some of the uh, people from the country and they do rebellion. The rebellion is not the fight between Christian and Muslims. The United Nations say that it, it are Christian who fight against Muslim. No, it's the problem of greed politicians who want to get the power for themselves. So it is not a matter of Christian fighting against corruption. You can see the picture of, suppose that your country look like this. Invade by people who have weapons and the weapon they want to kill people, not animals. This is a picture of what we went through in our country. Don can help me or put me and my family to get away from the country and find another place in the world to stay. But my wife and I, we say, God wants us to be in the midst of this type of life and to be a bridge to the generations, to meet the gap of people who don't know the word of God. The next picture show you we have displaced people even in the Iceland. People go away to protect themselves against the rebels group. Also on the tarmac of a universe uh, of the airport, many people want to die if airplane came and they can crush him, them, they like to die with that instead of being killed 
by the rebels people. So 150 people stay at the tarmac at the uh, uh, Bangui International Airport for three years. The next slides show you that the church service of internally displaced people were in the bush. Those who hide themselves in the bush, they continue to worship God. Even today, there are many people living not in the village because the villages are burned by the rebels. That can, the threat can cool the faith of many people because the crisis is coming and coming and coming. That can affect the faith of many people. That can weaken the authenticity of Christianity. And Islam is finding way to conquer the, the country by force. That's why they are still moving around in the provinces. Or they do it by marriage. And I say marriage because those who don't know where to find food, there are some people who cannot eat for one or two days, only drink water. They cannot go to the farm because the Muslims or the rebels are in the farm and they kill people in the farm. But in that condition, God has helped us to do counseling to people in the airport, the displaced people. Sidel has trained trauma healing counselors that we, spend, we, we send them to the displaced camp. They sit down with people, they read the Bible, they pray with them. And we discover that there are a lot of widows who did, did not have any, their home anymore. Their homes were looted and burned. So Encopas gave us some money and we built this type of home that you see. Two bedrooms and one living room for 28 widows that we made at the airport. And what we did is to put their man, name on the paper, we invite the chief of a neighborhood come and we give the keys of a home to those widows. We say, Jesus loves you, and Jesus built this home for you. Amen. And that really rejoiced their heart. So when we get money, we use the money, money in the proper way to lift up the life of other people. As you have seen, my wife also has, is resilient and doing the ministry of God with those ladies who are the pastor's wife and some wife from the seminary and medical work. They all come together and they try to bless other women in the area. They, my wife has a nutrition program as part of how she can help people who are starving and children who do not have food to eat. In the midst of a trial, in the midst of a difficult time, we can share what we have with other people. Africa, we live like a community and we can help other people. You know, in Africa, when you come to a home and people are eating, they invite you to come and eat with them. And we greet people and ask, have you eaten? Do you have something to eat? So Keris Alliance is one of the things that we are developing. All the countries who have been evangelized by Encopas, world partners, come together and they, we have created what we call Keris Alliance. And this is, we try to work on interdependence between churches, between countries. And we want to develop holistic ministries that give 
job to people so they can work by hands and provide for their family, provide for their churches, provide for the institutions that are in the country of Africa. We also want to develop characters so people can obey to God and do what God wants them to do and to train godly leaders. So you can continue to pray for us. Pray for the persecuted churches in Africa. Many countries in Africa are going through persecution. That we may remain faithful in following God. I think some of the video that you have seen, in the midst of trial, people are laughing. People are happy because something is in our heart. God has put in our heart, because of our faith, a spiritual compass that leads us in our journey to the Lord. Pray for the impact of the ministry of Sidel. I want to hire a young man to take my position. Next year, a young man named Dolo Emmanuel will come alongside me. And I will train him, I will mentor him for two or three years and then step out. Step out from being the leader or the director of a center of ethics, but I will continue my, the ministry of Sidel in Benin, in Togo, in Cameroon, in Congo, so that God willing, we can build chapels in some of the universities in Africa. Pray for the unrest and the security in Central African Republic. So I want to close by saying what faith brings in our life. You believe in Christ. Can you go outside of your comfort zone? Those among you who have made international uh, trip, if one day you can get out from your country, get out from your comfort zone and meet people from other countries, you will, change, you will be changed yes. from your heart, Amen. from your eyes, from your perspective. You will have a global understanding of what is going on in other part of a country. For example, if you come to my country and you see people starving, but they love Jesus, you cannot take for granted what God had put in your country here. You are so blessed, but some people are complaining. Some people are complaining of a lifestyle that God gave you here. Long life, we have short life. The life expectancy in Central African Republic is 58 years old. God has given me 62 years now. And I believe God will give me more years so I can bring the gospel of Jesus beside my country. And I can reach, you know, those in position of authority. God has given me the privilege to minister to the prime minister of my country for five years. Sit down in his cabinet, pray with him every Monday, share the gospel with the prime minister who now is the president of a country. And I want God to open doors so I can go to other countries and do the same thing. Maybe be the African Billy Graham. Work alongside people in position of authority. And I believe that the one in me is greater than those who are leading the continent of Africa. And if God can bring me, humble myself and work in the shoes of those in position of authority, the transformation will come in Africa. 
So you see that James is asking us, there are a lot of blessings from God. But are we persevering in our faith? Are we walking closer to God? Are we accepting trials in our life and count on Jesus? When tests come, how do we react? When things become worse, how do we react? When we find some difficulties in our life, how can you react when you bring your car to get a gas in the gas station and you, you can wait for six hours for one day? Maybe you park your car in the gas station for one or two days before you can get a gallon of gas in your car. This is the current situation my country is facing. I sent my, my driver to get gas for some of the French people who are now in Bangui for two weeks. He did not get the gas at the gas station because there is a, a long way of car waiting. There is a shortage of fuel because of Ukraine, the war in Ukraine and, and Russia. So this is the situation that but we are, God teach us to be patient, to wait and count on him. So thank you so much. All of you, we are waiting for crown. But remember, take time to pray. Accept that you carry your cross, like Jesus carries his cross. And then we will wear the crown that God will provide for each of us. May God bless you. Thank you for being partner with us. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for supporting our ministry. Thank you for that awesome challenge, Brother Augustine. I want you to have something that you can write with. I want to give you just a couple things that I want you to hold on to from the word this week. As we've been summarizing our study in the book of James, it occurred to me that when I was a child, I remember being part of a kids group that was called Missionary Helpers. And Missionary Helpers was a group of um, kids on a national level that were involved in knowing everything about Grace Brethren missionaries, praying for them, um, getting involved. We had little pictures of all the missionaries. I knew what all of them looked like. They were almost like baseball cards. And at national conference, we would go and get the missionaries to sign these pictures and we'd put them in a scrapbook and the one who got the most signatures of the missionaries got all kinds of prizes and rewards and missionary helpers club. And it was a very, very awesome experience. And one of the things that I remember so clearly from being a missionary helper was what the motto was of our club. And the motto was, pray, give, and go. Pretty simplistic, but this is the wrap-up of what I believe God wants us to get a hold of this morning. Pray, give, and go. You need to write these things down. The first one, pray. And I want to take just a couple references from James because we've gone through these passages and they have been powerful. Here is where application happens. James said to be fervent in prayer. As Brett preached it last week, 
the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person accomplishes a lot. Praying is not an exercise that we do in vain. It's not something that we do to just somehow bless the food. And we say it so fast, we can barely even understand the words we're saying. We say, dear Heavenly Father, and it runs together and has literally no meaning. We're talking about a conversational level relationship with Jesus Christ. Praying. And in James chapter 5, verse 16, from last week, you remember it says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So this is the promise of God. Many of you came forward last week. We anointed you with oil. We're seeing God in the process of bringing you healing. He's reconstructing things in your life as we speak because his promises always work. When God says this, he means exactly what he says. And the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman accomplishes a lot. And that's the reason why, as we hear Brother Augustine share what is going on in CAR, we need to get busy and do what we ought to do on a regular basis, and that is pray. Put yourself a list together. Get a list that you can activate and see the prayer requests and then opposite, see the answers. First Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. In other words, never stop. You think you've prayed? Time to pray some more. You think you're all done praying? You said everything that's on your heart? Time to pray some more. Start back at the beginning and start praying again. There's somebody in need in this church fellowship, in the Central African Republic, in one of those 4,000 churches over there that needs your prayer. Some little child that is starving, some woman who doesn't know how to protect her family or provide, they need prayer. Where will they get it? if they can't get it from their family. Because that is what we are, right? To as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the privilege to become children of God. We're family. That's why we call this the family of God. And your family in CAR need to know that you're here praying. I want Brother Augustine to know as he gets back to Africa and as they leave this place, He's going to have a picture of all of you and know that you're praying. He's going to know that you're praying. When times of persecution come, when times of heartache come, when they're tested, when they're having to persevere like he talked about, he's going to know that first grace is here praying for him. This is something tangible that we can do. You ought to be praying for your family every day. Pray for your marriage. Pray for your parents. Pray for your friends. Pray for the ministries at First Grace. Pray for our outreach possibilities. Pray for Ibales. They're on the front lines. They could be targets of the enemy. Pray, pray, pray. That's number one. Number two is give. Remember, pray, give, and go. Number two is give. And James talks about this. You remember as I preached this passage, um, we talked about the fact that we're all called to be stewards of what God gives us. What you've got is not yours. It belongs to God if you're his child. We say, well, I've got my money. Well, no, I'm sorry. If you're a child of God, that's his money. You might say, well, I've got my children. Well, <laughs> actually, if you're a child of God, those are his kids. He lets you have them for a few years. Maybe 18, maybe 20, maybe 25. I don't know how long, but they're on loan from God. 
The money that he's placed in your hand is a sacred trust. This is what the basis of stewardship is. Giving is a privilege. It comes out of the priority structure of our lives that we will be generous at all times, that we will pour out like God has poured into us. We are to be channels, nothing more. And James warns against hoarding finances. Now, I know that this goes totally against the grain of everything we're taught in our culture today. And any given time you've got on one of the conservative news broadcasts, you'll see a hundred commercials about things you ought to do with your finances and reverse mortgages and investing in gold and everything else. You've, you've heard it. And I understand. But listen, God says, don't hoard money. Put it to use because he's got an unending supply. My God supplies all your needs according to not my riches, but his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You'll have everything you need and you need way more than money. God's got what you need. And the warning in James chapter five is this. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Why is this? Because your riches have rotted and your, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. In other words, you've hoarded money. Instead of giving, when God said it's time to cut loose with the abundance that I put in your hands. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. So it's time not to hoard, time to give. We give into God's harvest field, and the harvest is so huge it won't even seem like we gave up anything. We're just giving back to God what's already his. If it weren't for God, we wouldn't have anything that we've got. And as I hear about the persecution in Central African Republic, I think, my, we are jaded in America. We've got so much. We've been blessed in so many ways. And I see the entitlement mentality and I see the spoiled nature of people who name the name of the United States of America and I think maybe finances are not a blessing after all. So I was talking to Brother Ibale last night. He told me about one of his first trips to America and uh, Pastor Jim Custer over at Polaris Church in Ohio here in Columbus um, took him out to a restaurant, a buffet, kind of like we went to last evening. And the sheer variety of choices and the abundance of food that was laid out. Brother Augustine looked at it and just began to cry. Why would that be? Well, it's overwhelming especially when you feel the guilt of so many brothers and sisters back home who have nothing to eat, no choices about what's next, no choices about what they're going to eat. We've been given so much. Jesus said, give, and it shall be given unto you. Luke chapter 6 Verse 38, good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. We give out of joyful opportunity. We're excited because we've got something that God can use. We don't hold back. Stinginess is not a characteristic of someone who's devoted to Jesus Christ. We give cheerfully, not grudgingly. 2 Corinthians 9 talks about that. 
And you need to just be writing these things down. This is all part of giving. We pray and then we give. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly. Not under compulsion. Because God loves a cheerful giver. So you give and you give and you give. So there's not another option. If we're devoted to Jesus Christ, this is how it works with prayer. We pray and we pray and we pray and we pray and then we say, okay, what's next? Well, you pray some more. Same thing with giving. You give and you give and you give and you give and then what's next? You give some more because we cannot outgive God. Listen to the next part. It says right there that he supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. We're celebrating World Harvest Month. A great harvest. We're celebrating awesome harvest. Why does harvest come? Because somebody was faithful and gave. And a lot of times we give by faith. We might not even see right now what we can give. But God says he'll supply the seed. He'll give you the capacity to give what he's laid on your heart. It's never too much. He knows what you've got and he's going to be your source for everything. So the last one is go. And of course, this is one of the power passages of the book of James. And he gets at it right there in that very first chapter. And I loved the way that Brother Augustine brought this correlation with what his ministry is really experiencing right now. Because if we don't persevere in the midst of trials, our faith isn't going to mean much, is it? I mean, a faith that works is what we really are longing for. It's a faith that endures in the struggle. It's the thing that causes us to be the authentic believer in Jesus Christ that he's destined for us to be. So this third part is he wants us to go. In other words, get busy. Don't spend all your time talking about all those things that you could do or sometime I might do this or, oh, I might be able to someday. He says... James 1, verse 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. Well, so how do we do the word? What did Jesus say? Well, it was his mandate. It was his final commandment. Before his feet left the planet, he said, go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, speaking to them, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So if we're going to hear, yes, okay, Jesus, what did you say to do? Go. Go, be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. There are some people here right now that I think God is definitely speaking to about this whole idea of going. Some of you need to think about missionary service. I know that there have been some of you who have talked about this. I know that there's been some of you that have gone to seminars, 
You've studied up on this. You've been in contact with sending organizations. And you've said, Lord, I, I think that this is something that maybe I could do. Yet, now it's back burnered. I wonder how many of us would be willing to be a doer of the word that Jesus spoke and not just a hearer. To be a doer and step up and say, yes, by God's grace, I cannot see right now how it's going to happen, but I see by faith I'm going. Number three is go, go, go. Do it, do it, do it. It's not just a Nike saying, it's a Bible saying, do it. Do it. Do it now. Be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. And Jesus is telling us, he's challenging us to do what he's commanded. This is powerful from the word of God. And of course, that mandate is to go make disciples. You know that that really encompasses the first two points of our mission statement. Number one is evangelism. Number two is equipping. And it's talking about discipling. We go, we preach the gospel, we preach the transformational, life-changing power of Jesus Christ in the gospel. And on the tip of that, we say, listen, Enter into discipleship. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Be one who goes after the meat and not just the milk of the word. Go deeper. Grow up spiritually. Grow. Be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It will change your eternity. And as I look at the continent of Africa... And I see the position of Central African Republic. I realize what's on the heart of God. I know he wants Africa for his glory. I know that he's putting his finger on the heart of some that are here today and some that are listening by live stream. You've heard and you've seen. Here's a man who doesn't even speak English as a first language. He comes and bravely stands up here and lets you know you have made a huge difference in his life. Do you know how much you're loved? Just that much. And just like a missionary helper would say, pray. Give. Go. Go. Do the ministry. Do what God commanded. Your life will be forever blessed. Let's pray. Jesus.